So let's continue where we left, shall we? So errors. When we are trying to make iterative improvements, one of the best places we can look is at the errors users make with the tools that they currently have available. We can fix those errors, but we can also use those errors to understand a bit more about the user's mental model. So here's a common example of an error for me, which is slip. I keep my email open in the window on the left. I frequently forget that it's my active window while I'm trying to type into one of the other windows and as a result, I'll hit a bunch of hotkeys in my email interface. I'll tag random emails, delete random emails. It's just a kind of a mess. Now this is a slip because there's nothing wrong with my mental model of how this works. I understand there's an active window and it's not selected. The problem is that I can easily forget which window is active. Mistakes on the other hand are places where my mental model is weak and for me a place where that happens is when I'm using my Mac. I'm used to PC where the maximize button always makes a window take up the entire screen. I've honestly never fully understand the maximize button on a Mac. Sometimes it seems to work like a PC maximize button. Sometimes it just expands the window a bit, but not to the entire screen. Sometimes it enters even like a full screen mode, hiding the top taskbar. I make mistakes there because I don't have a strong mental model of how it works. So if you are watching me, you could see me making these errors and you could ask me why I am making them. Why did I choose to do that if that was my goal? That works for both discovering hacks and discovering errors. Watch people performing their tasks and ask them about why certain things happen the way that they do. Discovering hacks and errors involves a little bit more user interaction than just watching people out in the wild. So how about we do that if we are doing something like creating an app that people are going to use in public? Well. Maybe we actually go up to people we see exercising out in public. We can actually get approval to do that. But that's going to be a little bit awkward and the data we get might not always be great. So at this point, we might be better off recruiting people to come in and describe their experiences. People experience hex and errors pretty consciously. So our best bet would likely be to target local exercise groups or local areas where exercisers frequent and recruit people to come in for a short study. Or maybe we could recruit people to participate in a study during their normal exercise routine, taking notes on their experience or talking us through their thought process. We can actually take that to an extreme and actually adopt something like an apprenticeship approach where we actually train to become users. Now, if you are designing interfaces for particularly complex, complex tasks, we might quickly find out that just talking to our participants or observing them really isn't enough to get the understanding we need to design those interfaces. For particular complex tasks, we might need to become experts ourselves in order to design those programs. This is informed by the domain of ethnography, which recommends researching a community or a job or anything like that by becoming a participant in it. It goes beyond just participant, observa uh, participant observation though. It's really about integrating oneself into that area and becoming an expert in it and learning about it as you go. So we bring in our expertise and design in HCI and use that combined with the expertise that we develop to create new interfaces for those people. So for example, video editors at massive open online courses or online teaching platforms like Coursera, Udacity, Udemy, EDX. They have an incredible complex workflow involving multiple programs, multiple workflows, lots of different people and lots of moving parts. 
there is no possible way I could ever sit down with someone for just an hour and get a good enough picture of what they do. To design a new interface that will help them out, I really need to train under them. I really need to become an expert at video editing and recording myself. Let me tell you that this recording is not the same as the recording that is being done at MOOCs like Udemy, Coursera, Udacity and other uh, like EDX and other platforms. So to design a new interface that will help them out, I really need to become an expert at video editing and in order to help them out, it's kind of like an apprentice approach. They would apprentice me in their field and I would use the knowledge that I gained to design new interfaces to help them out. So ethnography and apprenticeship are huge fields of research both on their own and as they apply to HCI. Now another uh, part of data collection is interviews and focus groups. A most targeted way of gather information from users though is just to talk to them. One way of doing that might be to bring them in for an interview. So I am sitting here with one of the potential users for our audiobook app targeted at exercisers and we are especially interested in the kinds of tasks the user performs while exercising and listening to audiobooks at the same time. So to start, what kind of challenges do you run into doing these two things at once? Now listen to the audio clip response. The biggest challenge is that it's hard to control it. I have uh, headphones that have a button on them that can pause it and play, but if I want to do anything else, I have to stop, pull out my phone, unlock it, just to rewind. So yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Interviews are useful ways to get at what the user is thinking when they are engaging in a task. You can do interviews one on one like this or you can even do interviews in a group with multiple users at the same time. Those tend to take on the form of focus groups where a number of people are all talking together but about the same topic and you can use them to tease out different kinds of information. Focus groups can elicit some information we don't get from this kind of an interview, but also present the risk of overly convergent thinking. People tend to kind of agree with other instead of bringing in new ideas. So they should really be used in conjunction with interviews as well as other need finding techniques. Now here are some 5 quick tips for conducting effective interviews. Now we recommend reading more about this before you actually start interviewing people but these should get you started. Number 1. Focus on the 6 W's when you are writing your questions. Who, what, where, when, why and how. Try to avoid questions that lend, lend themselves to one word or yes or no answers. Those are better gathered via surveys. Use your interview questions to ask open-ended semi-structured questions. Number 2. Be aware of bias. Look at how you are phrasing your questions and interactions and make sure you are not predisposing the participant to certain views. If you only smile when they say what you want them to say, for example, you are risk biasing them to agree with you. Number 3. Listen. Many novice interviewers get caught up in having a conversation with a participant rather than gathering data from the participant. Make sure the participant is doing the vast majority of the talking and don't reveal anything that might predispose them to agree with you. Number 4. Organize the interview. Make sure to have an introduction phase, some lighter questions to build trust and a summary at the end so the user understands the purpose of the questions. Be ready to push the interview forward or pull it back on track. Number 5. Practice. Practice your questions on friends, family or research partners in advance. Rehearse the entire interview, gathering subjects is tough, so when you actually have them, you want to make sure to get the most out of them. Now interviews are likely to be one of the most common ways you gather data. So let's run through some good and bad interview questions real quick. So here are 6 questions. Which of these would be good interview questions? 
note down the ones that are good for the ones that would be bad briefly brainstorm a way to rewrite the question to make it better number 1 do you exercise number 2 how often do you exercise number 3 do you exercise for health or for pleasure number 4 what if anything do you listen to while exercising number 5 what device do you use to listen to something while exercising number 6 We are developing an app for listening to audio books while exercising. Would that be interesting to you? Now personally, I think three of these are good questions. Do you exercise? Is not a great question because it's a kind of a yes or no question. How often do you exercise? Is actually the better better way of asking the same question. It subsumes all the answers to do you exercise. but leaves more room for elaboration or more room for detail do you exercise for health or for pleasure is not a great question because it presents to the user a dichotomy it might not be the way they actually think about the problem maybe there's some other reason they exercise maybe they do it to be social for example we want to leave open all the possibilities a user might have so instead of asking do you exercise on instead of asking do you exercise for health or for pleasure we probably want to ask why do you exercise the next two questions work pretty well because they leave plenty of room for the participant to have a wide range of answers and they are not leading them towards any particular answer we are not asking for example what smartphone do you use to listen to something because maybe they don't use a smartphone This sixth one is interesting. We are developing an app for listening to audiobooks while exercising. Would that be interesting to you? What's wrong with that question? When we say we are developing an app, we introduce something called social desirability bias. Because we are the ones developing the app, the user is going to feel some pressure to agree with us to support our ideas. People like to support one another. and so even if they wouldn't be interested they will likely say that they would because that's the supportive thing to say no one wants to say hey great idea sandar but i would never use it so what we want to make sure to do is create no incentive for a user to not give us the complete honest answer worrying about hurting our feelings is one reason why they wouldn't be totally honest so we might reword reword this question just to say would you be interested in an app for listening to audiobooks while exercising now granted the fact that we are the ones asking is still probably will tip off the user that we are probably thinking about moving in that direction but at least it's going to be a little more collaborative we are not tipping them off that we are already planning to do this we are telling telling them that we might be thinking about doing it and so if they don't think it's a good idea they kind of feel like they should tell us right now to save us time down the road so by rephrasing the question that way we hopefully avoid bias the participant to just agree with us to be nice now think a loud protocols are similar to interviews in that we are asking users to talk about their perceptions of the task but with think aloud we are asking them to actually do so in the context of the task so instead of bringing user in to answer some questions about listening to audiobooks while exercising i'll ask her to actually think out loud while listening to audiobooks and exercising if this was a different task like something on a computer i could have her told her just come into my lab and work on it but since this is out in the world what i might just do is give her a voice recorder to record her thoughts while she is out running and listening now think aloud is very useful because it can help us get at users thoughts that they forget when they are no longer engaged in the task but it's it also a bit dangerous by asking people to think aloud about their task we encourage them to think about it more deliberately and that can change the way they actually act So while it's useful to get an understanding of what they are thinking we should check to see if there are places where what they do differs when thinking out loud about it we can do that with what's called a post event protocol which is largely the same 
except we wait to get the user's thoughts until immediately after the activity. That way, the activity is still fresh in their minds, but the act of thinking about it shouldn't affect their performance quite as much. Now, most of the other methods for need finding, like observation, interviewing, apprenticeship, require a significant amount of effort for what is often relatively little data or its data from a small number of users. We might spend an entire hour in interviewing a single possible user or an hour observing a small number of users in the world. The data we get from those interactions is deep and thorough, but sometimes we also want broader data. Sometimes we just want to know how many people encounter a certain difficulty or engage in a certain task. If we are designing an audiobook app for exerciser, for example, maybe we just want to know how often those people exercise, or maybe we want to know what kind of books they listen to. At that point, a survey might be a more appropriate means of need finding. Surveys let us get a much larger number of responses very quickly, and the questions can be phrased objectively, allowing for quicker interpretation. And plus, with the internet, they can be administered, administered asynchronously for at a pretty low cost. A few weeks ago, for example, I came up with the idea for a study on Friday morning, and with the great cooperation from my colleagues, I was able to send out the survey to potential participants in less than 24 hours. Later, I received 150 responses within a week. Now, of course, the data I received from that isn't nearly as thorough as what I would receive from interviewing some of those participants, but it's a powerful way of getting a larger amount of data. And it can be especially useful to decide what to ask participants during interviews or during focus groups. Now, survey design is a well documented art form. In fact, designing surveys is very similar to designing interfaces themselves. So, many of the lessons we have learned in our conversations apply here as well. Here are five quick tips for designing and administering effective surveys. Number one, less is more. The biggest mistake that I see novice survey designers make is to ask way too much. That affects the response rate and the reliability of the data. Ask the minimum number of questions necessary to get the data that you need and only ask questions that you know that you will use. Number two, be aware of bias. Look at how you are phrasing the questions. Are there positive or negative connotations? Are participants implicitly pressured to answer one way or the other? Number three, tie them to the inventory. Make sure Every question on your survey connects to some of the data that you want to gather. Start with the goals for the survey and write the questions from there. Number 4. Test it out. Before sending it to real participants, have your co-workers or colleagues test out your survey. Pretend they are real users and see if you would get the data you need from their responses. Number 5. Iterate. Survey design is like interface design. Test out your survey, see what works and what doesn't, and revise it accordingly. Give participants a chance to give feedback on the survey itself, so that you can improve it for future iterations. Now, writing good survey questions. Surveys are used often in HCI because of their convenience, but they are only useful if the questions are actually well written. Tips like be aware of bias and test it out are good pieces of general advice, but there are also lots of specific things that we can do to make our survey questions better. So in fact, there are six things I personally recommend in survey design. Be, called, be clear, be concise, be specific, be expressive, be unbiased, and be usable. Let's go through what these actually mean in practice. Be clear means we want to make sure the user actually understands what we are asking. So if we are using a numeric scale for example, we don't want to just give them numbers. We want to actually code those numbers with what they mean. It's not uncommon to see some larger scales code only for only the first, last and middle number. 
but it's always better to assign some kind of label to every single number and make sure they are parallel. We wouldn't want something like high, highly dissatisfied, dissatisfied, neutral, a little satisfied and satisfied. We also want to avoid overlapping ranges. If we are asking about some range of numbers, so here we are asking how many times per week do you watch Hulu? So if a user says they generally watch twice per week, it's not clear whether they would choose 0 to 2 or 2 to 5. Instead, we want to make sure the ranges don't overlap. If we are in doubt on whether the user will actually understand your question, we should provide some extra detail. For example, if we are if we were asking do you own a tablet computer, we might infer that not all our users really understand what a tablet computer is. So we'd go on to define and say it's a computer with a touch screen and detachable keyboard. That improves the likelihood that the user actually understands what we are asking. If we are asking about a frequency, it's useful to time box it. So for example, if we ask how often do you exercise, users might not fully understand what the difference between rarely and occasionally is. For example, is rarely once a week, once a month, once a year, is frequently every day, five times a week. So instead, we probably want to ask a question like, in the past seven days, how many times have you done this behavior? That's a much more objective question and a lot easier to answer. Second, we want to be concise with our questions. We always want to make sure that ask our questions in plain language that the user can understand. So for example, instead of asking something like, what was the overall level of cleanliness that you observed within the car that you rented, we'd ask, how clean was the car? Now it is worth noting that sometimes being concise and being clear are at odds. Adding more detail inherently means being less concise. So it's a trade-off. Use your best judgment to decide when adding more detail will be worth the trade-off. Third, when asking questions, we want to be specific. We want to avoid questions that are on super big ideas. For example, how satisfied were you with the interface? Well, there's a lot of elements of satisfaction with using an interface. Asking about satisfaction with the interface as a whole is such a big question that it's hard to answer. Instead, we might ask a series of smaller questions like how satisfied were you with how quickly the interface responded to your commands? Or how satisfied were you with how easily you could find the command you were looking for? Part of this is avoiding what are called double barrel questions. A double barrel question is a question that asks about two things at the same time. So for example, if we were asked, how satisfied are you with the speed and availability of your mobile connection? What if a user were satisfied with the availability but not satisfied with the speed? How did they answer that question? So instead, we will break this up into two questions. One asking about speed and one asking about availability. We also want to avoid questions that allow some internal conflict. This is similar to avoiding questions about big ideas. For example, how satisfied were you with your food? Well, I might have been satisfied with the taste of it, but not with the temperature of it, or not the appearance of it, or not with the representation of it. So instead, we break that down into a smaller question that each address each individual component of satisfaction. Four, we want to be expressive or really what they should say is allow the users to be expressive. We want to make sure to emphasize the user's opinions. Sometimes users taking our surveys are hesitant to be very emphatic or very critical. So we want to make sure to emphasize in the questions that we are looking for their opinions. Instead of asking, is our subscription price too high? We might ask, do you feel our subscription price is too high, too low or about right? 
In the second version, a user could say too high without feeling like they are being very combative. Whenever possible, we want to use ranges instead of yes and no questions. That allows the user to express more of the details about their individual answers. So instead of asking, do you use social media? Yes or no? We might ask, in the past 7 days, how much time have you spent on social media? This allows the users to express something more closely resembling the complexity of their answer. If we are asking about something with levels of frequency or levels of agreement, we want to give lots of levels. Simply saying, how satisfied are you, dissatisfied or satisfied isn't enough to capture the full range of user opinions. I generally recommend always using at least 5 so you can differentiate people who are highly satisfied which means I have no complaints from people who are satisfied which means I have, might have some complaint but overall it's a positive experience. That's actually a pretty useful distinction to arrive at. When possible, it's also useful to allow users to make multiple selections. For example, imagine we were asking what social media platform do you use the most? Then we are losing something with those users who think they use multiple platforms with equal frequency. So instead, why not let them choose more than one? There might be some good reason why we want them to choose only one. Maybe some follow-up questions are based on that. But a lot of times, it may also be beneficial to allow them to select multiple answers. For questions that are nominal or categorical, it's often good to let them add new categories. So instead of just giving them 6 to choose from, we could give them 6 to choose from but also a box to put in another one that allows them to express ideas that we didn't anticipate. My fifth piece of advice is to be unbiased or to avoid bias wherever possible. And the last question is actually a good example of that as well. If we don't give them that other box, then we are biasing them with only our pre-established selections. Now sometimes that's okay if we have done a lot of surveys in the past and found that these are the only answers anyone ever puts in, then it's okay just to limit the space to only those. Just remember, if you provide users categories and don't give them another box, then you might be biasing them towards only those opinions that you anticipated. But even if you provide another box, you still risk some bias. So for example, if you ask, why did you choose our service over our competitors? A user might look at these options and say, well now that you mention it, I guess it was because of her, your good reputation. But if you ask them this question without giving them options, they may have given a different answer. It was the act of reading these options that made them think, maybe that's why I did that. So often, it's good to actually leave these potentially open-ended questions open. Let them just say in free text why they chose your service. Now again, if you have done the survey for a while and have a lot of these open-ended question responses and you found that there's only really 4 or 5 answers that user ever put in, then it's okay to distill those down to options. In that case, you have done enough data analysis to understand that these are really the only selection. But if you are not yet sure the full space of answers, you might receive, it can be better to leave it open-ended. We also need to avoid leading questions. This one is a little bit more obvious. If we are asking for opinions on our new interface, we don't want to say something like, did a brand new AI-based interface generate better recommendations? Yes or no? Obviously, here we want the user to choose yes. Instead, we should ask it in a more neutral fashion. How satisfied were you with the recommendations the interface generated? Finally, my last word of advice is to make your survey usable. Now a lot of this is actually going to come down to the details of the survey platform that you choose, but some of the, these are decisions that you make as well. For example, it's always good to provide a progress bar that lets the user know how far along in the survey they actually are and adjust their expectations accordingly. It's not uncommon for users to quit surveys because they don't know how close they were to the end.
even though in reality they were only a few seconds away from the last question along the same line it's good to make your page lengths consistent if you have a five page survey you don't want one one question on the first page and 50 on the second page and two on the third page if a user opens a second page and sees 50 questions they are going to naturally assume that the remaining pages also have 50 questions so try to make them consistent to set accurate expectations about how long the survey is going to take third order your questions logically there should be some natural flow to the order in which you ask different questions you don't want to go from a demographic question to a satisfaction question back to a demographic question you want to gather your questions into topics ideally they should take the user along with the th thought process that you want them to engage in while answering your questions fourth at the end of the survey it's good to alert users about unanswered questions On the one hand, maybe the user didn't know they skipped the question. This lets them know so they can go back and answer. But on the other hand, maybe they skipped that question intentionally. Maybe they weren't comfortable answering. Maybe they just don't have an answer. Maybe your space of answer options didn't capture what they thought. So you don't want to force them to go back and answer it, but you also want to account for times when they may have accidentally skipped it. So let them know but don't force them to go back. Finally, preview the survey yourself. This takes some discipline. I have lots of surveys that I never preview and later found out I used check mark boxes instead of radio buttons for a particular question. So force yourself to actually preview the survey and fill it out as if you were a real user. Don't just scroll through it. Actually go through and answer each question. So that was a quite a lot of information but i am hoping the fact that most of the tips were pretty practical and will make it easy to apply when in doubt remember you can always ask for feedback on your survey questions before sending it out to the actual participants now writing survey questions is an art as well as a science so let's take a look at an intentionally poor designed survey and see everything we can find that's wrong with it. So on the left is a survey it's kind of short mostly because of the screen real estate note down the questions that are wrong with this survey let's take a moment here Now I hope you have uh, answered the questions or uh, like noted down that why this survey questions are not good If you haven't done it just pause the video and then do it. So here are few of the problems that I intentionally put up, put into this survey. Some of them are kind of obvious but hopefully a couple of others were little bit more subtle and a little bit more interesting. First, when I say on a scale of 1 to 4 with 1 meaning a lot and 4 meaning not at all, what do 2 and 3 mean exactly? It's not a very clear scale to just say the end point. Just giving the end points doesn't give a very clear scale. We usually also want to provide an odd number of options so that users have a kind of a neutral central option. Sometimes we will want to force our participants to take one side or the other, but generally we want to give them that middle neutral option. Either way though, we definitely don't want to change the number of options between those two questions. having one b1 to 4 and other b1 to 6 is just confusing and even worse notice that we are reversing the scale between these two in the first question the low number means a lot in the second question the high number means a lot that's just terrible design we want to be consistent across our entire survey both with the direction of our scale and the number of options unless there's a compelling reason not to The second question is also guilty of being quite a leading question. Why do you like to exercise assumes the participant likes to exercise. What are they supposed to say if they don't? And finally the last question is a yes or no question. Have you listened to an audiobook this year? Yes or no? No is a kind of an interesting answer, but yes, I don't know if you listened to one audiobook this year or a 100 audiobooks this year. 
I don't know if you listened every single day or if you just listened once because you had a gift certificate. So we want to reword this question to be a little more open ended and support a wider range of participant answers. Now there are other details as well and I am going to share them with the next video. So keep practicing with the survey questions and keep applying these uh, few suggestions or few tips which I gave you and see that whether they bring out some good in your survey questionnaire or not. Let me know in the comment section.